press the bell icon and never miss an update from ET Auto. We all try to gaze into the future, but there are very few who can see it clearly and start the action. One such person has been Mr. Chetan Mani, the founder of Riva. And that Riva later on transformed into E2O under Mahindra Electrics. Now again, he has taken another step towards future and in the same space, electrification as well. He is going to provide the battery swapping option that has been in the talk for quite some time. Welcome to ET Auto, Mr. Thank Manny. You. It's always a pleasure talking to innovators like you. So now you have uh, a new solution ready. That is the biggest roadblock that we talk about infrastructure in terms of battery swapping. It's been quite some time now. How do you see the progress and acceptance for your technology? Well, uh, <clears throat> we started with looking at buses and uh, with Ashok Clearland we showcased a solution where in two and a half minutes we could swap the batteries out of buses uh, and this allowed the cost of buses now to be similar to regular vehicles and the cost of energy to be cheaper and the refueling time to be actually faster than uh, uh, diesel equivalents or CNG equivalents. Uh, our next step was to look at the largest market in the country which is two and three wheelers. We have over 20 million of these vehicles produced every year. Could we create one solution for all of them? Um, so recently we showcased our solution which is a ubiquitous solution that goes for all two and three wheelers. So you can use one, two or three battery packs. A swap is less than one minute. And again, you can now get vehicles that could be actually, for the first time, electric vehicles could be actually more cost effective than gasoline versions and refueling time that's much faster and at lower cost. So you're trying to hit the mm, toughest uh, part of uh, going electric when it comes to mobility in India that is bringing down the cost. What kind of response have you got and how many uh, customers you have at hand right now? So over the last nine months we've been developing the technology. Uh, we're now undergoing field trials and we will start customer trials in the next couple of months on this area. Uh, but we have several OEMs who have signed up, we have several fleet owners who have signed up and internal trials are right now happening and the feedback has been extremely positive at this stage. Who are the customers that have signed up, if you can share a few of them? <laughs> so we, we have some large fleet operators. Unfortunately, we are under NDA, but in the next month or so, we'll be free to uh, announce them. Uh, but they're in different spaces. We're looking at different uh, fleet areas for delivery, for passengers, and other areas. Uh, the OEM we've announced is Leyland. Uh, other OEMs in two- and three-wheeler space we've also signed up that we're looking at developing. Our whole focus really has been in the shared economy. You know, 80% um, to 85% of people in the city travel in a two-wheeler, three-wheeler buses. So our idea was to attack these three forms of transportation first that could have the most meaningful impact in the country and society. You have been doing a strong study and uh, analysis of the Indian market uh, when it comes to electrification. Uh, what is your thought? What is your guidance? What kind of penetration do we see segment-wise? I think it would be very different segment to segment. I think the part that would take off the fastest is going to be shared mobility because there we can actually give the end customer a lower cost solution. And in a shared mobility market for a person who drives, either deliver goods or for passengers, if he's able to get more money at the end of the day, that makes a big difference. So you think it will be more of an intra-city or you think we can have this in long uh, journey, long travel as well when it comes to uh, fleet? I think it would be both, but it would start with, uh, within the cities because also pollution is a large challenge within cities and so uh, it would make more sense. But with swapping, intercity becomes very easy because if you can swap in a couple of minutes, then halfway through your journey, it doesn't really cause a long one hour or two hour refueling, which is typically for electrics. And so that could allow us to even move into those areas much faster. How are you working on uh, fixing the problem because we have a uh varied segments in passenger vehicles, also in two-wheeler, different power demands, different structure of the vehicle. How will the swapping be possible in the, across segments? So we see the segment as three typical categories. One, all two and three wheelers, where we use one solution. And we use one, two or three batteries. So you can get almost triple the power and, uh, and everything from probably a small e-rickshaw two-wheeler all the way to probably a one-ton vehicle could be managed within that application. On the top side, which, are, which our focus has been on buses and commercial vehicles. Now, the same solution works across 9 to 12 meter buses and also 
uh, it can be working over commercial vehicles. So these two have been the two segments where we haven't today put a lot of, uh, uh, haven't had a solution fully running is the car side. That will be something we come later. But today we've looked at two areas which cater to probably a large portion of the market segment. Uh, going forward in the next five years, what kind of electric vehicle penetration do you see across segment? I think in, it would be segment dependent. In generally in shared mobility, so that would be three-wheelers, maybe taxis and buses, I think the penetration could be up to 30 to 50 percent on this area because it Five makes years. business sense, yes. I think personal mobility will be much less because people are choices about a brand, about how the seats feel and a host of other things. In two-wheelers, again, I think there could be very high penetration because there, again, it makes business sense. Distances are shorter. Um, so I think it's a segment-driven uh, approach, both from a vehicle point of view and a usage point of view, then probably a one-size-fits-all across the entire industry. Uh, well, one of the things that I see uh, for you is next step is expansion and scalability. How are you planning? What is your strategy? Are you looking out for investors from outside or are you going to do it from your own side? So, um, over the, having showcased all the solution, we've got a tremendous amount of interest uh, on the investor community and we are now exploring those opportunities because we believe that the large growth rate is going to be very is big and we would like to see the right kind of partners associated with us as we go into this mission. Have you got any concrete uh, plan on that? Anybody who has uh, taken a few steps, advanced step when it comes to investment in your new technology? So, so far, uh, the in investments has been by myself and my partner Uday on the Sun Group, and so we continue to put it in. Uh, we, uh, we have a lot from the other side, but maybe it's a little too premature to discuss that. So, um, uh, you will restrain yourself as a solution provider or you plan to get into vehicle manufacturing also, because your start point has been a vehicle manufacturing. Does that attract you again to go back to that? I think what we want to do today after doing vehicle manufacturing for 20 years is be an enabler. Uh, by providing the solution, we can be a, give a solution to multiple OEMs. So we become a partner to OEMs. We become a partner to mobility solution providers who want it. We partner with energy providers to get all of this. So we see ourselves as an important ingredient to enable the EV ecosystem working with all stakeholders. So at this stage, I don't think, I think there are enough OEMs doing a lot of good products and our best interest would be to help uh, get these products quicker to market and quicker to consumers with a good value of proposition. So going forward, you must be looking at assessing your uh, competition also. Can you give us a sense what kind of investment going to go in electric and uh, related uh, value chain when we talk about India especially? I mean, the auto industry is 7% of our GDP, right? So it's going to be a $250 billion industry by 2030. The energy side is probably a $200 billion opportunity that's going to be transformed. So with electrification, I see at least a 50% transformation in this. So between the auto space of infrastructure and the auto space of components and everything, you're talking over $200 billion. So it's large. It needs investments not just from us, but from a lot more people on this area uh, to really make that impact. So uh, I, I think it's going to be a big play and it's a great opportunity for the industry to look at it. So uh, from last year to this year, there has been a big shift in narrative when we talked last year, the ministers talked about complete electrification by 2030. Today, the main thrust has been that, look, the ICE engines are going to continue. Uh, top industry leaders, ministers, they continue to uh, talk about in the last two days that, yes, we are going to go for electrification, but that is not going to be 100 percent. And it is... Uh, ice engines are going to be there. More of uh, they are trying to provide a solace to the uh, conventional manufacturers. Uh, how do you see that? Well, I mean, if we think of India, you know, uh, we have infinite sun. Uh, by 2030, we want to create 300 gigawatts of renewable energy. And by then, if we had 350 to 400 million vehicles on our road, we could power every vehicle on the road with less than 250 gigawatts of renewable energy. So the larger play for government to say, hey, listen, can we go electric and powered by renewable energy is very important and very big, especially considering the last six months, you know, what oil prices has done to the dollar, what has done to our current account, and how it's impacting the inflation in the society in a big way. So, so the big picture, I think, is very critical. 
right? In the short term, you have to have multiple solutions to, to, to coexist. So I think uh, the role of the government is to play the larger vision uh, for the industry. And I think even if we don't achieve 100%, we achieve 50% or 40% electrification, that would be huge as a change. Uh, but sometimes that's important. But what, what has really led to this change in narrative? That's what I wanted to understand. What has worked uh, in behind in one these one years or these few months, you can say? I think that there, you know, the industry is, believes electrification is the future, not just in India, globally, right? Um, I think that they're not fully ready. There are very few players ready. So it needs a little more time. Suddenly you've said, let's get going and and you need people you need supply chain you need you need tier one people you need all your infrastructure people so it's going to take two to three years for momentum to grow some companies have had a head start that have been working on others are catching up on this area but i do see the right signs the amount of investments that have happened in the last probably 12 months in the ev space the number of new startups the number of new infrastructure players the new policies from the government be it on low energy tariffs or looking for buses or car orders to be used within cities are all very positive signs, right? Uh, I think it's more about these signs that I think are right, which I haven't seen in 20 years in the industry. So I'm, uh, I'm very bullish that, uh, and you know, with the MOVE Summit coming and the, the prospects of having newer policies in place, I do believe that it would be set the country, it could set the country in the right direction. Are you happy with the kind of uh, subsidy that the government is talking about? We were talking about about above 9,000 crore, which is now uh, reported to be less, uh, around 5,000 crore. Uh, are you satisfied or do you think it's a, a better, something is better than nothing? What is the status? Well, you know, when you separate batteries from vehicles, uh, you can actually get vehicles to be cost neutral and you can get the cost of energy to be actually cheaper. So the requirement of subsidy over time is going to be less. Um, I think that we have a country which has limitations. We have a limited, limited amount of finances. If they can go in to set up the right infrastructure and incentivize the right areas and shared mobility that's very impactful, it can give a jump start to the industry. And I think long term the industry will self-sustain itself like it is starting to slowly do in many parts of the world uh, once there's been a momentum created. So uh, it's more important that there's a long term policy, not a year or two, but how does the, how does the government see the next five to ten years in the industry. If it sends the right signals there, people will invest. Other players will come in. It's not just that what they do, it's about how they set the road. I think that's more important than probably a particular subsidy in a particular area, uh, which is a short-term uh, uh, good demand creator, but long-term sustainable policies are what's going to make the country grow. Thank you so much, Chetan, for Thank talking so to you. Thank you.